welcome to the Provo Library Podcast. I'm Erica Hill. I'm the Community Relations Manager. I'm Carla Gordon. I'm the Library Director. And today we are talking all about books. Um, we have our best books of 2023. <laughs> Forgot what year it was for a moment. It's fine. <laughs> it's definitely, there's no reason for that. I'm just, anyway, best books of 2023. It's 2024 right now, but we're talking about everything great that came out uh, last year. And so today we're going to be joined by four other people, and they're going to each give a little preview of um, their favorite books. So in the event, we're talking about how many? Three, I think. Oh, oh at oh. the event, 25 times five. 125 books. We are not talking about 125 books on this podcast. We are talking about 15. And it'll be great. And then if you want more, you're just going to have to come to the event or look at the lists online in the event that this is posted after <laughs> <laughs> or that you're coming to it after. Um, so we're going to start with Carla because that's easy. And I'm here. And she's here. And I'm here. So I am, so we're going to have five sessions and each session will have like a different age topic kind of a thing. So we'll have children's easy readers, children's and picture books and children's fiction and then teen books and adult fiction and adult nonfiction. And I am representing adult nonfiction. And I have picked 10 books to talk about on that day, which is March 12th at the Best Books event. But I decided to talk about three books that I'm not talking about, but someone else is. <laughs> because Carla, <laughs> sometimes this is, this is just a little behind the scenes. Um, a lot of times librarians do as close to duking it out as librarians do, which means politely discussing. <laughs> um, but they like fight over who gets to present about what book. Usually I just, I have enough books usually that I would like to talk about that I just give them away. But I thought it would be fun to steal these because they don't know. Because Carla, <laughs> Carla's like, don't worry. I read 200 books. So and you pick your you pick your favorites and then I'll... Not 200 books. But... You've probably... I'm going to... 100. I was going to say... It's over 100. Yeah. Usually every year. But it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of... It's a lot. Anyways, there were some really great nonfiction titles that came out last year. And the first one I'm going to talk about is called Outlive, The Science and Art of Longevity. Rethinking Medicine to Live Better Longer by Peter Atia. Have you, did you read this? No. No. So it was really good. It's the science behind staying healthy. <laughs> I like, I like to say it this way. It's about how to stay healthy and active until the day you die. Oof. And then you just drop dead. To not. That's what my dog sick. is going to do. <laughs> You're, it's not healthy. <laughs> Your dog is not healthy. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Sorry. <laughs> So he's got some great things in there about like diet, what to do, exercise, what to do, what kind of medical tests to do, how to talk with your doctor, what kinds of things. And I really, one of my favorite parts about it is it says like, you need to make a goal for what do you want to do when you're a hundred? Like, do you want to be able to like run with someone or do you want to be able to just get up off the floor with your grandkids? Like, what is your goal for good living at a really old age? And then you need to exercise and like focus on that. So if... Being able to go for a walk is the thing. Then you need to focus on that. And it was interesting, some of the things like um, when people fall, it's often because their grip is not strong. And so he talks about making sure that you're exercising your grip because when you go to grab like a railing or something, if your hands aren't strong enough to keep you up, that's when people fall and break hips and things. And so just those kinds of little little things to just keep an eye on. The one thing that I didn't like about this book is he, he gives so much that if you did all of the things he told you to do, uh, I think your quality of life now would go down because you just don't have that much time to exercise and to put that much effort into what you're eating. Like they're all really good things, but you can't do all of it. You can do some of it. And I think just picking the pieces that work for you. Also, it's and so perhaps, expensive. And perhaps stressing about not doing the things that you ought to do will ultimately help put you along. But yeah. Every time I go, just try and have less stress in your life. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll I'll try. Just, I'll do that. No, it was, it, 
it would take a lot of money to do everything that he, so I think he kind of came from a place of privilege, if you want to say something like that, like just talking about like all of the things. And I'm like, not everybody has that kind of resources or time or all of those things. So I, but I do think it was, it's so interesting to read and to pick out the pieces that um, align with what you want and what you're looking forward to as we get older. I really just don't want to live till I'm 100. I think that sounds exhausting. I want to drop dead at like 90. No, I, I want to make it. Good. Yeah. I do. I don't know. My husband doesn't. He's like, mm, 80 sounds good. And I'm like, no, I don't want to live 20 years without you. We're both and living to 100? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. That's okay. Anyway. It just sounds like an accomplishment. Oh, it does. But also, it's a long time. I just don't want my kids to be talking about me the way that I'm talking about my dog. <laughs> so. Just put it down. <laughs> That's the worst. Okay, sorry. Um, next, <laughs> uh, I read Romney, A Reckoning by uh, McKay Coppins, which probably have heard about this one. But I really liked it. I'm kind of a political junkie a little bit, um, especially lately. I don't know. The, that is the, true. The pandemic Carla. broke me. And or. I became, or, yeah. Like, anyway. Do you? Uh, no. So it was a lot dishier than I had expected. Mm-hmm. Like, he talks a lot about different people. I liked his history and just, like, hearing where it came from. This is the thing about memoirs and biographies. I just love getting to look inside someone's brain mm-hmm. and, like, finding the reasons why people do the things they do. Like, I hear that they do something, and I'm like, I can't imagine why there was a good reason to do that. And then you read a biography or memoir, and sometimes you get that in. This was a biography, because it's not written by him, but um, he had, the author had a lot of, um, had a lot of access to like journals and stuff like that. So I felt like I got a lot of like a memoir-ish kind of a feel for what Romney was thinking at different times um, based on journals and what the reasoning behind some of the things that he has done. Anyway, it was just super fascinating. Again, I love biographies and memoirs. And my other one is a memoir called Making It So, a memoir by by Patrick Stewart. Sir Patrick Stewart? Sir Patrick Stewart, who reads the audiobook. Ooh, which slowly. Means, I mean, I sped it up, obviously. I also listened to, this is off, but like Barbara, who, which is also Ooh. on the list. Yeah. That was 40, 48 hours is that memoir. And I listened to it on three times speed because, I mean, she's reading it herself and she's She's older, yeah. so it's very slow. Which so you is can't really, speak to that. I know. I was gonna say, which is really interesting because I actually think of Barbara Streisand, like in "What's Up, Doc," mm-hmm. as like this, like fast talking. Uh, not in her memoir. No, no. <laughs> but it was anyway. fascinating. Anyways, Patrick Stewart. I mean, he just has a great accent. He's fun to listen to. I really loved his early life, like re- listening to um, his adventures and kind of his family life and stuff. I mean, it wasn't all. He went to some terrible boarding schools. But why he got into acting and stuff, um, yeah, I just didn't know a lot about him. It was fun to have some of the behind the scenes for like X-Men and Star Trek and some of the Christmas Carol stuff that he did and what it was like to be knighted. Like just yeah. like how all of that happens and how he felt about did it. Did he have a good to... reason for why he voiced Pooh in the Emoji movie? He did not bring that up that I remember. I'm sure it was a decision he didn't <laughs> want to to discuss sometimes you don't know really so, i've never seen it so. you shouldn't excellent it's i made the right choice so it may be on the <laughs> library shelves i don't know i'm i don't usually like i'm just not going to recommend the emoji movie to anybody i came away like angry that that time was gone yeah but sir patrick stewart as the poo emoji was the highlight but seemed like an odd choice. And I just hope he got paid a cool million for that. <laughs> well, I do, I really like it just to hear, like I, like I said, the behind the scenes, their justification, but also I like to see if like, would I be friends with this person? Mm. I don't actually think me and Patrick Stewart would be really good friends. Not He's a little bit more intense and mm, anyway, than I like to have my close friends. Be. Sure. I like a more relaxed kind of an attitude. Romney, maybe we'd be friends. I think he's kind of snarky, which I identify with. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are three (laughs) that I will not be talking about. That Carla blatantly stole from (laughs) someone someone else's list. And they might have a different reason for liking them. They might have different attitudes about it. Maybe they're like, 
I came to this biography because I just loved his work in the Emoji movie. Maybe. Maybe <laughs> I picked it know. up. And then I found out that he was in Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? That feels a little bit like when um, I listened to The Night Circus, which is read by Jim Dale. And I was like, oh, the narrator from Pushing Daisies does this? And someone went, also the Harry Potter books. <laughs> well. Pushing Daisies. Pushing anyway, Daisies was a great show. It was. Emoji movie. <laughs> Pushing Daisies. Pushing Daisies. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're so going to have another guest. We are. And as if by magic, they're going to appear on this couch. I don't know. We were joking about me doing like a little magic-y thing. And now I'm feeling self-conscious about it. But I'm going to do it anyway. So who's next? Fiction? I, I mean... Let's see. Use your magic and see who appears. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to do... I'm going to do the I Dream of Jeannie. And we're just going to see who's here. Okay? okay. So, Marcy, here Hi. you are! <laughs> Hi! Welcome! <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so, I was told that you wanted me to talk about three of my top five books. Yes. And I went rogue. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Carla also went rogue in a different way. I might have inspired you. <laughs> or we inspired each other. Uh, so yeah, I just, I'm going to talk about three books that I loved that did not make the cut for my top five mm -hmm. books. So my top five books are a secret still. We did talk about how it was kind of brutal this year because for some reason we just had much, we had a lot fewer books. I think we invited more librarians to join in. So we got to pick fewer books and it was kind of brutal. It's hard to pick just five, so. Also, when we compared lists, Carla and my lists were like the same. <laughs> as far Duke as what we out. really loved. With polite conversation. <laughs> exactly. Right. But <laughs> these three books are still ones that I really loved. So first book that's maybe like six or seven or eight on the list. Um, what you are looking for is in the library by Michiko Aoyama. Uh, this book is one I consider to be like the ultimate cozy, gentle read. If you want to just sit and read a book that you don't, you just want to escape. You don't want to worry about anything. This is the book for you. Um, it is really a collection of short stories, all set in a certain t suburb of Tokyo. Um, each character in each story is someone who they're in a different space in life. They're not quite happy with the way things are going. They wander into the local library where they meet this strange librarian who gives them what they want. But then she also gives them a random book recommendation and a little felted toy that she has created. Sounds like a librarian thing to do. Yeah, she sits at the desk and felts all day while people aren't asking her questions. I do not do that. I was going to say, I never... That, that, <laughs> I'm going to say we keep our librarians far too busy for felting. I have not picked up felting while I've worked in a library. Um, yeah, so it's either this like random book that she offers people or the little felted toy that kind of inspires them to try something new, expand their life, and find some new purpose and make their life happier. And that's what each story is about. So a nice, cozy. So is it like a short story kind of collection almost with this yeah. one character that's always like the librarian's there every time? Yeah, the, the librarian's there every time. Um, and even like characters will show up as like background characters in other stories. But, but yeah, each chapter is about a different person and their journey as they come to fulfillment. Was it originally written in Japanese? It was. And then translated in English? Yes. Cool. Yeah, that's why it takes place in Tokyo. And yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was originally published in Tokyo a few years ago. It was on their bestseller list, so they translated it. Yeah. Uh, for something completely different, The Meister of Decimon City by Brenna Rainey. This is just a fun sci-fi novel. Um, the residents of Decimon City don't know what to do with their resident genius scientist, Rex. On one hand, she cured cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah. On the other hand, she cloned dinosaurs. <laughs> and they escaped her lab and like did a bunch of property damage through the city. So the Golden mayor... <laughs> 
kind of a lot. The mayor has declared that she needs to be on house arrest and she needs to prove that she is not an evil mad scientist. And the way she has to do this is by helping the local superheroes fight the local supervillain. However, the local supervillain is her brother. Huh. So she's got some conflicting <laughs> choices going on. She doesn't want to help her brother, but she also doesn't want to like hurt him. Um, this is, like I said, it's a fun story, so you don't want to get too bogged down while you're reading it. Don't worry too much about the plot. Just have fun with it. Uh, this, it reminded me a lot of John Scalzi's books, like the Kaiju Preservation Society and Starter Villain. It's got that kind of vibe if you know his books. My very favorite part was the dinosaurs. They can talk. They call her mom, which is hilarious. I listened to the audiobook and there was like, mom, mom. Um, they also just get into all sorts of hijinks. So this is a fun sci-fi if you're looking for something like that. It was fun. And then um, I have something else. I have a mystery, The Twyford Code by Janice Hallett. This one I liked because of the way it was written. This is written, um, it's transcriptions of voice notes left on an old iPhone. So you can't trust it from the get-go because it's got like unintelligible <laughs> sections <laughs> and parts where words have been obviously switched. Like must have is always translated as the word mustard. <laughs> Yeah. So basically typos. Right? <laughs> typos, kind of. Like autocorrect. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you can't really trust what's going on. But as you read, you follow this man. He just got out of prison. He's actually trying to find his old high school teacher who disappeared when he was in high school. She disappeared while she was looking for buried treasure. And he's... Common, common pursuit of high school treasure. <laughs> high school common teacher. Problem. Um, he is sure that there are clues to this buried treasure left in an old children's novel from like the 40s or 50s. So he is trying to solve codes to find buried treasure to find his old teacher. If you can follow all that and pile on top of that, this like you're reading all this in a transcript that you can't trust. For me, I thought just that combination of it's really like four or five mysteries in one. Um, it was really intriguing and a lot of fun to read. Mm -hmm. So that was great. And then I'm going rogue again. I is that a fourth? <laughs> it's a fourth, a fourth one. But I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you too much about it. I just wanted to say, <laughs> I am not one of the librarians giving you nonfiction picks this year. But I, I just have to tell everyone. <laughs> about my favorite nonfiction book, which was The Six, The Untold Story of America's First Women Astronauts by Lauren Grush, which was fascinating. You get to learn all about Sally Ride and five other women who were just amazing. So nonfiction was breaking all of them. Oh, I know. such <laughs> rebel librarians we've got here. Next thing you know, I'm going to start felting at the desk. <laughs> <laughs> And these were the non picks. These were the non picks. Sounds really fun. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. you have yeah. some really good picks. I think so. So, <laughs> yeah, you should definitely come to Best Books. Yes, come. Excellent. Okay. We're. So, we were so excited to start the last segment that I actually didn't introduce our last guest. So, in case you're wondering, that was Marcy Beard. She's an adult and teen librarian. And now we're here with Larissa Anderson. Hello. She's hello, also hello. an adult and teen librarian. Yes, I am. And you are talking about teen books. Teen books. I am in charge of the teen books, ordering all of them, and I just can't get enough of reading them. So yeah, I'm here to talk to you about three of my favorite books that I read last year. Um, the first teen book that I read that I loved was called um, No One Left But You by Tosh McAdam quick little summary. Um, it's a small English town. 17-year-old trans guy Max meets Gloss, loses himself in an all-consuming relationship, but after his ex-summer romance turned bully ends up dead, yeah, ex-summer romance turned bully ends up dead, um, and Gloss takes the blame. Max fears dangerously close to being implicated, and it's just everything that I wanted, that I want in like the teen murder mystery, right? Um, 
I've been reading Nancy Drew since I was a tiny child. So teen murder mystery, but the, the book itself, the characters in the book stuck with me. Um, Max and Gloss specifically, that the two main characters are just captivating. Um, and the, the uh, school library journal called this book euphoric. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I felt like that. I could not stop reading this book. And it, it's a dual timeline. So it kind of before the murder, after the murder, Love before it. the murder, after the murder. And I just, I loved it. And I can't recommend it enough. I don't know what about your description made me think of Veronica Mars, but does mm. it have that it's kind very, of vibe? Yes, mm -hmm. it's very Veronica Mars, which I just watched for the first time recently. Ooh. Yeah, I didn't watch it when it was on, so I'm uh, late to that game. Welcome, welcome to the club. So fun. <laughs> I should have, I should have known. I should have known it would be for me. Um, but yes, very Veronica Mars, very whodunit, but also, you know, the, the best friend is implicated and, and oh gosh, it's, it's quite a wild ride, wild ride. And also, of course, teenagers tend, we get so, it brought me back to be in the mind of a teenager, like being just all consumed with your relationship with your best friend or this or that. And you just get so wrapped up in other people. You can't, you know, you don't feel like a different person from them. Oh gosh, I just thought... I never want to be a teenager again. But I remember. <laughs> but I love this book, and it brought me right back. Yeah. Euphoric. Yes. Yeah. Euphoric. Yeah. So, um, I, I brought my next book with me. This is where you see yourself. Where you see yourself. I don't know if you'd like to see. You know, oh, I like would pass it around the class or anything. But um, this is the main character, Effie Galanos. This is where you see yourself by Claire Forrest. Um, Claire or Effie is the, our main character. She's a senior in Minneapolis. She's in a wheelchair, she, she has cerebral palsy, and she just wants to live her life, you know, and her best life like we all do. So she's a senior and her dream is to, to go to school in New York. Mm -hmm. So this, just the most delightful, um, like interpersonal relationships in this book and the main character, Effie, I wrote down, um, learning to advocate for yourself is so difficult, but Effie, just this whole book reaffirms the importance of, of advocating for yourself and standing up for yourself. And uh, uh, the I didn't realize until the end, because I did not read the back book jacket, when I got to the author's note at the end, the author herself has cerebral palsy. And it just made all of the, you know, Effie's internal monologues and all those things just feel even more invaluable as a reader. These are like my... I mean, I read mysteries, but I don't love mysteries because I never see myself in those situations. Like, I just don't ever feel like it really, I don't know. But like, you don't anticipate like that you're going to solve a murder in your life? I mean, this is, this I mean, this is bucket what? list for me. I seriously hope not. Your ex-best friend turned lover <laughs> ends up, or what, turned bully? I don't turned, yeah, bully. whatever. Well, all of that, I don't think that's going to happen to me. But like, I love to be able to get into the life of someone that I don't, like, I don't know what it's like mm -hmm. to be stuck in a wheelchair like that. And I think something like this, it's such a way to gain empathy and for teens to gain empathy. Just be like, oh, and not just that, but like, oh, they were an advocate for themselves in this situation. I can be an advocate for myself mm -hmm. in this different way that I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, in whatever hard in whatever way. Whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever difficult thing. I love the, that. The book starts with, with her simply just advocating. She's been in high school for four years and she still has difficulty getting around the the physical building and so it just kind of starts with that baseline of like all right I gotta do this for myself I hate doing it for myself but I gotta do it so yeah remember the high school that you and I went to I do and how yeah. it was in like eight different buildings yes and there it would were be stairs a and no elevators it would be a nightmare for this character yeah I actually broke my toe the in, and they had to move my math class from the third floor down to the first floor because there was no elevator. Because I sprained my ankle and they didn't do that didn't for me. Your class. Oh, yeah. I didn't go to that high school, so I feel left out. Intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to my last one and my favorite one, of course, because it's last. This is My Dear Henry by Kaylin Bayron. Who... Eye patch on the front. It, the, no. I thought it, it was an eye patch. Oh, okay. It's the fog. It's okay, it's just the, the fog. Thing. That the fog is what caught my eye I with this book. I wanted an eye patch. I did okay. too. Yeah, That's no. Cool. So, the yes, the Jekyll and Hyde remix. Um, Seventeen-year-old law clerk Gabriel 
um, is, I mean, just trying to make his way, living in a boarding house in London. Um, his best friend is the son of Dr. Jekyll. And um, it's, it gets weird. His, uh, <laughs> it gets, of course it gets weird. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, his, Can't imagine that's a healthy yeah, family dynamic. But, uh, <laughs> the, oh, the, Okay, let me read this to you. <clears throat> Monsters of all kinds prowl within the London fog, and not all of them are out for blood. Ooh. And again, the fog on the front, I, the fog, the candles, the look, the, pos the potential eye patch. I want it to be an eye know. patch. But his, I mean, top hat is good too. Yeah. It's cool. And this, this top author, hat with eye patch. <sighs> That's a protagonist I want to hear That about. is, That's yeah. <laughs> Uh, just so moody, so spooky, like atmospheric was the word. I was looking it up, like how do I properly use the word atmospheric because I feel like this is this is that. Um, it just was everything that I wanted a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde remix to be. Like um, still set in London, still set back then, but the relationship between the main character and Dr. Jekyll's son is a really tender, wonderful friendship. And then of course, uh, Hyde shows up and who is Hyde and where did he come from and oh no where yeah it's... I like this come out of the dark and show yourself I demanded I could the young man said but where is the fun in that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. moody okay it's a spooky <laughs> spooky moody great awesome feels like a good like fall read yes I read it right around Halloween I think that's when it caught my eye fantastic mm -hmm. took me down my my remix uh rabbit hole that I'm currently on Oh, awesome. So, yeah. Retellings. Yes, I love them. We've got some, there's some great ones in YA fiction too. And I, I think that's the thing I love the most about YA teen fiction is that it's, you get your stories and you get like those meaty stories, but it's a little bit faster to read. <laughs> you know, a little bit less of a commitment It's not a 48 as an adult. hour audio. Yeah, book. yeah, right. No, it's not. You know, someone was telling me, they were talking about Brandon Sanderson and they were like, you know, Elantris, the short one. <laughs> Brent just listened to Elantris. It was still 29 hours. The short one. The short one. <laughs> I'm, most of his Mistborn ones are shorter than that. They are. See, I'm a, anyway. I'm a Stephen King stand, oh. so like, Those give me a 50-hour Stephen yeah. King audio book. I'll just put that one away. Sounds great. So, you know, <laughs> one Stephen King or three teen novels. Right. You, yeah. you, you can choose. Your choice. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for having I me. I now want to listen to all of these. Yes. I, yes. So, so good. Amazing. Thanks for coming. Hey. Your list is going to be fantastic. This oh, it's now going to be them. much more varied now that I've <laughs> realized. <laughs> I need to <laughs> maybe branch out. Yeah. Yes. This, we were Diversify just talking my before we started the podcast, but um, before we snapped her in, she that we come to make our list. And then as you're making your list, you realize that you read a lot of the same things same kinds of things that you have kind of a tone for the things that you read and we want to be able to recommend all kinds of things so mm -hmm. it is sometimes this goal to yeah I'm gonna read a guidebook so right. that I can put it on my list. I've, been, I've been trying to read <laughs> fantasy and graphic novels for for the for YA yeah is that so I know what to recommend okay well thank you for being here yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wiggle my nose and we're gonna get a new person Okay, here we are with Caroline McFarlane. Both of those things I pronounced correctly. You did so good. Good job. You think? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we were talking before about how that is not always easy for people. Caroline's a children's librarian. Yes, I am. And she's here to talk to us about tween yes. books. Yes, so tween books are kind of my, my sweet spot. It's what I love the most of all. Um, and 2023 was a big year for books. There were a lot. It was also a big year for me personally. I read a ton. Um, and it's always hard to pick favorites, but there were three that the whole year long I kept coming back to and kept talking about. Did they win awards? They did win awards because <laughs> I'm so good at you're, picking what wins awards. A taste, a, a taste I am a tastemaker. So First Time for Everything by Dan Santat. Graphic novel memoir. It's a National Book Award for Young People winner. Um, Dan Santat's a favorite of a lot of people at the library too. He's a very nice guy. And this is his like memoir of the specific trip he took to Europe when he was um, in the position between middle school and high school. He went with a bunch of other kids to Europe and just had this like coming of age moment. The illustrations are great. The story's great. If you want a graphic memoir, it's a really good one. Love Dan Santat. We love Dan Santat. He did out me as oh. pregnant 
to. Did, did he mean to? Well, sort of. I don't know. <laughs> I. This is. I'm. I'm monopolizing your time here. You're fine. But he came for a children's book festival, yeah. and I wanted to get a copy of uh, Beagle oh, signed. Yeah, sure. Um, but we did not know the gender of our child yet, oh. and so I wanted it to be like this is for the baby because I do that, yeah. and so I just had him sign to the little one, oh. and he looked at it, and there's like multiple, and I had not told anyone at the library I was uh-huh. pregnant yet. He just looked around, and he was like, "What are you gonna sell this on eBay or something <laughs> to the little one? Who's this?" And I was like, "No," and but he just like kept egging me on about it, <laughs> and I was like. It's for the baby that I'm pregnant with and uh, Jean and Joella. Found out then. And they were like, oh, you're pregnant? Thank you. Thank you, Dan Santat. Dan Santat. It's a good story. Excellent illustrator. Great book. Outer of pregnancy. Outer of pregnant people. (laughs) Wow. I did not know the story. Wow. How dare he? It's funny. Okay, so there's that one. Mm -hmm. We've got Mona Lisa Vanishes by Nicholas Day. It has kind of spot illustrations from Brett Hillquist. Wanna Cybert, so it's an informational book. Nice. Um, it kind of is all about this time that the Mona Lisa was stolen, which I think a lot of people don't know. Um, but so it talks about how the Mona Lisa was stolen, but also how it was returned, how it was found. Um, and it has all heisty. of these like different heisty elements kind of working in. It's pretty fun. That's it's awesome. a fun one. Okay, and then my last one is our Newberry winner, which I talked about at Best Books in the Summer. So if you came in the summer, I said it was one of my all-time best books, and I stand by it. It is such a fun, little, weird, unique book about a dog, and it's from the dog's perspective. It has a great audio. It has cool illustrations. It is a weird one, but it's so good. And the title is? The Eyes and the Impossible by Dave Eggers, illustrated by Sean Harris. Fantastic. Yeah, there you go. A dog. A dog named Johannes. As they often are. Sometimes. Maybe (laughs) only here. (laughs) can't think of others but yeah it's a fun one it's a good one it's about a dog he lives on an island he's kind of the caretaker for the island he's the eyes so he reports back to the bison of everything that's going on um and then this like mysterious art exhibition gets put in on their island and he gets drawn in by art so it's another one kind of about the power of art which is always a good topic super weird book it is so weird (laughs) listen when you read as many children's books as i do the weird ones are the ones that stand out the most when you're like this is different and i love it that's how i felt about inquisitor's tale yes a little bit also a weird one yeah a lot of my favorite ones are this is like canterbury tales yes like who thought of this but there's like toxic dragon farts and everything it's so good time i read a book from the perspective of a dog i swore i never would again you have another chance. I don't know. Art of Racing in the Rain. Man, I know everybody loved that thing. This is an important point of The Eyes and the Impossible is that no dogs die at the end, which is really <laughs> important to know if you're considering reading it's not. It's not a dead dog book. Not a dead dog book. Fantastic. That's really important. Okay. Okay, those are my three. I've got more, but we'll save them for best, for books. best books. Yep. Okay, we're going to have a new person come. Okay. So thanks for being here. Bye, everybody. See ya. Okay, we are here with Joella Bagshaw. Hello. She's our children's services manager, and she's going to talk to us about, it looks like, picture books. It is picture books. I brought three books, and because picture books are a big illustration type of a thing, I just brought them for those of you watching on YouTube podcast. I'm sorry, come visit me, and I'll show them to you later. Um, Do I just jump in? Jump in. Jump in. Okay, the very first book that I wanted to talk about as my, this is my favorite picture book from 2023 is Big by um, Vashti Harrison. This book was like the winner in not just one way. Like everything. So it won the Caldecott Medal and Vashti Harrison is the first African American to have ever won the Caldecott Medal. So that's a huge deal. And um, it also won the Credit Scott King Illustrator Honor and the Credit Scott King Illustrator our author honor as well. So it ha- should have three shiny stickers on and there. And the Provo City Library, Mock Caldecott. One of two Mock Caldecotts, but yes. Yes, it was an honor for our second Mock Caldecott yeah. though. So it was a big, a big deal. So this book, um, what it is about is there's a little girl that's born and um, they tell her that she's such a big girl and she's such a big beautiful baby and oh aren't you so cute and she thinks it's a good positive thing 
And then as she's growing, she's still a big girl because she's just a big girl. And all of a sudden, um, the narrative changes to, why are you so big? Why are you taking up so much space? You should, maybe you should stop eating mm-hmm. so that you're not so big. And maybe, maybe have you tried being thinner? Have you tried mm-hmm. having smaller thoughts? And it's this emotional journey of this child and what happens as people talk to her and, and don't accept who she is as who she is and thinks she needs to change. So, so powerful of a book. The illustrations are phenomenal. There's a reason why it won three different shiny stickers. Um, but yeah, my most favorite book, of uh, picture book of 2023. I'm gonna turn these pages quietly as <laughs> quietly. you talk about the next one. Okay. Actually, no. I will turn them after. <laughs> Our sound guy says, thank you. You're welcome, Stephen. <laughs> sound guy probably hates that I bring them because they have the shiny covers on them as well. But he'll, fix okay. it in, he'll fix it in post. All right, here we go. All right, so my next book is actually a nonfiction picture book. This is called The Book of Turtles by Cy Montgomery, illustrated by Matt Patterson. And the first time I read this book, which won a cyber honor, which is the informational honor award this last year. But the first time I read it, I actually thought I was looking at photographs. Amazing. But these are not photographs. None of the pictures in here are actually photographs. They're all, um, you know, I don't, I don't remember. I looked it up once upon a time. Some medium. Some medium. It looks like pencil. It it does look like pencil, especially on the back over here. Anyway. that's amazing. Yeah, but there's interesting facts about all different kinds of turtles and tortoises and you get to know all about them and how they breathe and hibernate and lay eggs and what the different characteristics are as to what makes different subspecies of different things. And if you have a child who happens to love reptiles and animals, this is a book that you should look at at some point. <laughs> should look at me. <laughs> Just maybe. Um, but I, I will say that once I read this book, I actually went with... Um, our family to Hogel Zoo afterwards. And we spent so long looking at all of the different turtles and their habitats and the tortoises because we love this book. But we also have two turtles at our house too. So it's, we're a turtle loving family. Did I know, I didn't know that about you. What are your turtles' names? Um, so our red-eared slider is Laudza. Okay. And our um, box turtle is Kongza, which are both Chinese names that my husband came up with. It's um, Confucius and uh, some other philosopher in Chinese. Oh, so there very you go. good. Random facts you didn't know about me, but there you go. Anyway, this is a really fascinating illustrated nonfiction. Is this checked out to you? None of these are checked out. They're all checked out. Well, maybe you checked out to me. Well, maybe they will. <laughs> After this podcast. There you go. Okay, my third book that I brought is There Was a Party for Langston, King of Letters, and it's by Jason Reynolds illustrated by Jerome and Jarrett Pumphrey. This one also won some awards. Um, This one was a Caldecott honor and a Credit Scott King illustrator honor as well. Was this a mock Caldecott honor book? This was a mock Caldecott honor book twice for the Provost City Library. The most prestigious of all the awards. (laughs) There you go. It is true. It does have mock in the title, so maybe that's... (laughs) There you go. Um, So this book is fascinating because um, it's actually, I'm going to slowly open Uh, this maybe. There we go. There's a picture back here and there's a picture of, and it's Maya Angelou and um, Amiri Baraka, I think is how you say his name. And they're Mm. dancing in a library. And Jason Reynolds came across this picture and was like, this is an interesting thing because why are these two people dancing in a library? And they actually had a party celebrating Langston Hughes in New York City. And they went to this party and were dancing and celebrating Langston Hughes. So this whole book is having a party at a library celebrating words. And the thing that's really interesting about the illustrations in this book is that, um, so the words It's Jason Reynolds, who is a powerhouse um, children's author and um, and a poet and just all around amazing, amazing author. Anyway, so he's writing and a lot of it is poetry and the illustrators have taken those poems and you can kind of guess by this, like this is, these are all words 
that describe what's happening in the book. And so as you're reading the book, sometimes you have to read the illustrations to understand and get the full actual text. And it's kind of like concrete poetry, just dancing through a party celebrating one of the literary greats in um, New York City. So it's a fantastic, wonderful book. So those are my three that I brought, and now you get to hold all of them. Because it's like I'm giving them to you. (laughs) I'll keep them. Yep. Very good. There you go. Joelle will have more favorites at the Best Books event. And um, I think that's it. You know, the thing that we didn't talk about in this one or the last one is what we're currently reading. But we have talked about a lot of books this episode. So you're just going to have, just like the mystery of why the elevator is so slow. You're going to have to you're, wonder what it is we're listening what, to right now. What it'll, it'll be the great mystery. You're just, you're just going to have to wait till next time. Bated breath. So anyway, thank you for being here. Um, Best Books is on March 12th. If you're listening to this after March 12th, Best Books was on March 12th. And lists, full lists from our librarians will be posted on our website. Yep. That's what so. we do. That's what we do every year. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here.